All right, hi everyone. I'm Daniel Adeyemi, Senior Reporter Tech About. And welcome to another edition of Inside Identity. Now, Inside Identity used to be Digital Identity Matters a webinar series, which is part, which is powered by um, Verify Me Nigeria in partnership with Tech About. So Verify Me is an identity, identity verification and KYC technology company that provides trusted identity verification for seamless customer and employee onboarding. They also provide AI-powered facial recognition technology for e-commerce identity, ID authentication. So you get to learn more about um, this and other things. Today's topic is pretty much about the fintech space, which is simply how African fintech companies can achieve regulatory compliance. If you've been following the conversation in the past year, or ever since, there's always something happening with the governments just coming up with something and um, fintech companies not being either not meeting up or, or you know there's a misunderstanding or something like that. So regulatory compliance is important because without the regulators, uh, many companies wouldn't. I mean, you wouldn't survive. Um, this event is organized by Tech About Insights, the basically an African-focused digital economy consultancy that leverages big data to help startups, investors, big tech companies, governments to help answer specific questions and implement key interventions. All right, so before we get going, um, we're gonna have a keynote presentation from Sarah um, Essien, who is the COO of Verify Me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Essien. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Verify Me, as Daniel mentioned, so thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome you to Inside Identity, formerly known as Digital Identity Matters. Uh, we hope you're as excited about today's conversation as we are. But before we jump into it, I'd like to let you in on some really exciting news at Verify Me. So most of you probably would have seen on social media yesterday that we relaunched um, our B2B2C product as Core ID. As you know, it's evolved into something bigger than it was before. Um, so we'd like to introduce to you Core ID, a Verify Me company. Core ID provides unified digital identity solutions with customizable workflows, enhanced reporting and customer analytics all on top of the already robust infrastructure that we have. This transformation was a logical next step for us as we continue to build Africa's trust economy. Verify Me will now continue as a retail company, providing a web portal for individual background checks, while Core ID will focus on B2B2C integrated solutions. You can learn more about this at coreid.com, so Q-O-R-E-I-D.com. Um, and if you've got questions or anything, feel free to reach out to our team on business at coreid.com. Without further ado, um, let's get into today, today's conversation. Over to you, Daniel. Awesome, thank you, Sarah, for that. Really exciting to hear that. All right, us to this conversation. So as you know, also joining, welcome everyone is joining. Uh, my colleague Eniola is in the chat room moderating so she's going to be dropping links information just guiding us through the conversation and now to our panelists so we have you know a bunch of amazing persons here who are going to be speaking about you know, compliance in the african fintech space we have four amazing persons i'll start with um first person ab Wanapere. ab is the head of treasury and platform operations at bamboo um where he oversees you know all of bamboo's treasury compliance regulatory engagements in all its markets and prior to this, you know, AB has also worked um, with other banks, you know, um, FSDH, Merchant Bank, which is one of the biggest merchant banks in Lagos, and also Access Bank. Welcome, AB. Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, awesome. Um, next, I'd like to just welcome Daluchi Iwanya, who leads the compliance team at Quidax. She's an um, She's an ACAMS certified AML specialist and a certified fintech compliance associate, associate with expertise in creating and executing compliance strategy. So Dalichi, welcome. Good to have you. I'll just go. Um, next person I'd like to invite, um, welcome is SCJ Aguele. You might know him. Uh, SCJ is a co-founder and CEO of Verify Me Nigeria. He's responsible for, you know, running the company, but beyond that, he's an enterprise architect, engineer, and operations experts with, expert, with experience in building fintech products 
and leading public sector business transformation programs, such as the system, seasoned engineering, enterprise solutions architect, and business transformation and development expert. So SCJ, welcome again. Happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Then uh, last we have is Michael, Michael Safo. Michael is a certified information systems auditor, certified information security manager, certified information security experts, a lead auditor, and you know, many other things. He has over eight years of experience in banking with conversance with foreign operations, IT audit, and compliance. Michael, good to have you. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. All right, so I'm gonna be jumping right into the conversation. And so people who are just joining, thank you for joining us. So we're gonna first talk to um, the panelists. We're gonna have a few conversations. And while, while this is going, you can drop your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat room, the Q&A box. And after about 40 minutes of conversation, we're gonna to jump to answering questions from members of the audience. So you can start dropping your questions as soon as you find anything you know fascinating or anything you would like to you know just point out all right and uh, to my panelists i'd like to start with ab uh, compliance and fintech that's actually that's a every, every sector is regulated every sector in itself has to face compliance but you know fintech it has to do with money so <laughs> nobody's smiling or joking and um first question is you know, regulatory, regulatory compliance seems to be like a tricky subject, particularly for fintechs, because it's just getting into the space. And as we popularly say, you know, regulation tends to catch up with innovation. I'm curious, how can early stage startups navigate this journey? Yeah. yeah thank you for your question, Daniel. Um, I, I, would, I would always say right when i'm talking to people around compliance and fintech um, regulations and you your business being regulatory compliant always starts from the point at which you from the point at which you even like get the idea and you begin to work on the idea um, from the time you try to build the business case for the idea you must begin to think around how does this idea fit into the current regulatory space and how welcoming will it be to the regulators as it is at the point in time right so from, for, for the very first thing every um, FinTech founder needs to do um, to be compliant is to first of all, like just research heavily. Research heavily and understand the regulations around the space you are playing in. Um, it shouldn't surprise you though, if there are no clear regulations that fit into your particular business. Um, just like Daniel said, regulations always try, always catches up with, um, with innovation, right? But you should, you should look at, um, I would I would say that you should look at the regulations that are closest to your business and try to work try to work around it. Maybe not in its entirety, obviously, but as you should like just try to get as close closely as you possibly can. Um, I will I will um, I, I will give an example, right? To, to, <clears throat> I'll give an example, right? If you want to, like for example, open a digital bank today. Um, if you want to open a digital bank today, a lot of the, the, what a lot of people would do naturally is to first of all try to approach the central bank or try to acquire a microfinance bank license or maybe try to partner with one right um, but if what you are looking to if what you are looking to bring on board today is not exactly a is not exactly um, a digital bank or your product is an offshoot of a digital bank and you kind of feel like um, because it's an offshoot of the digital bank and it's not exactly a digital bank um, so you're not sure if um, having a microfinance bank going to acquire a microfinance bank license is the right play to make us at that time right the right thing for you to do at that point in time is to um, is to is to partner with probably partner with a microfinance bank that way you are not overly committed to, to, to get in the microfinance bank license, right? So um, you should also understand that in the finance space, um, um, something that is very common and, and a common joke around um, compliance guys when, we, when, when I talk with some of them, right? Is basically that um, you don't get to choose your regulators, right? Um, your regulators are wherever your regulators say they are, to be honest. Um, if the CBN says that they are your regulator, if you like, you can roll on the floor, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are your regulators regardless, right? Uh, so putting that into perspective, right? Um, finance products are, us are usually qu 
quite inter intertwined. So sometimes you may need to you may need to design your process, your business properly, or else you would find yourself reporting to multiple re regulators, right? And that is why I said um, it's very important that you think about you you think about how you want to comply regulatory wise at the point at which you are building your business idea. By the time you are writing it down or trying to like just um, put things in place. Um, if you're not careful, you would be reporting to like just multiple regulators. Um, I would give, I would try to give an example again on, on that aspect, right? Um, so if you, if today you, if today you want to give, you, you want to open an app where you give loans, right? For example, you give loans to, to people, right? Uh, many loan companies today do not just go ahead to get a microfinance bank license. They mostly start from um, the legal state money lenders, license right um so you you probably go to get the money lenders license just to give loan um but you see that's your that's your loan business right because you have the legal state money license money lenders license by the time you start to service people outside of Lagos, you've gone beyond the purview of that your license that you have by the time you um by the time you by the time you 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 now think that oh because you're giving loans right you now want to go beyond just giving loans and you say oh your cost of funds uh, with which you used to give the loans is too high you now want to add savings to that right that your money lenders license does not allow you to do that you now need to go and get um you now need to you are forced to go and get a microfinance bank license or partner with one, right? Just because you want to add savings to it. But again, just by virtue of you adding savings to it, you think you've, you've, you getting a microfinance bank license, you think you are just reporting to the CBN, right? Um, if your savings product crosses over from just being savings to an, to become an investment product, where you give investment, where you, um, where, where people get investments from you, right? Uh, then you are no longer just reporting to um, CBN again under the microfinance bank license. You now need to also go and report to SEC, right? Because you now you are basically now um, offering investments. So that is one way, then one very easy way where a lot of people like you could go about reporting to multiple regulators um, just because you've not been able to define your product properly from the get go, right? Um, I would also say that um, I would also say that. Um, you shouldn't be scared, right? When uh, you shouldn't be scared to walk up to your potential regulators. Um, you shouldn't be scared to walk up to your potential regulators and discuss your business with them. Most especially when your business, um, most especially when your business is is one that there are no current regulations that cover that covers it, right? If um, your business line. If, you're, if whatever you're doing, right, um, there are already regulations that cover it, it's very easy. You just go ahead and you comply with the regulations. But if there are no regulations covering it, then the smart thing for you to do is to like approach your regulators and also talk about it just even at the point at which you're building, just so that you can get them in the right headspace that this is coming and they can start to think along those lines if that is something that is not already, already in play. But again, they could even advise you to, why don't you... Um, why don't you comply with this other regulation, right? And that would also suffice for, for, for your business, right? Um, so that is something that I also like, like kind of ask people to do, right? Um, but one thing that I would ask you to, I would also advise you to do when you're, when you're doing this is that you should document, you should, even when you go to your regulators to speak to them, when you come back to your office, send an email to your, send an email <laughs> to your, tell your lawyers to do it later to them. <laughs> Is seeking the same advice that you've verbally gone to ask, right? Because, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't need to explain why that is necessary, right? Um, uh, then also, um, I also know that early stage startups don't have a lot of funds, right? So employing lawyers and compliance teams might, um, uh, might, might be a big deal. But I would absolutely advise that you engage a lawyer that is already familiar with the regulators, that with your reg the regulators you'll be facing or that you'll be dealing with. Uh, with or are supported um, fintechs <clears throat> playing in a similar space that you're going to play in, um, you will find that um, just at the point of at the point of like building your idea, you when you when you approach a lawyer, you get this necessary advice on how to proceed. You will see that um, it does help the business at the long run. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you, Abi. You had a lot to say. Uh, you don't get to pick our regulators, just like you don't get to pick our parents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, interestingly, you know, talking about even you know knowing where to get um get you know who who's in charge. You know, I found out um, earlier this year or last year that you know, for example, the money lender license is under the Ministry of um 
Home Affairs, which typically is the same ministry that does, that covers uh, religious activities, public holidays. And it just seemed very weird that, you know, you have this non-related, I just have money lender on, on that, that. And you wouldn't think that it would be on that. And then, I mean, why is it there? You don't know, but it's there. And then you have to go there to, yeah. <laughs> to get a license. <laughs> so you can find, you know, approval in a few, you know, places that you wouldn't expect. But hey, I mean, if they say they're the ones approving, <laughs> you have to go and do that. So that, that's very fascinating. Um, CJ, over to you. I'd like to ask, I mean, you've been in this space, you know, working with a number of startups. What are some unique challenges you've observed, you know, in the fintech industry as regards to identity verification? Because really compliance really starts from identity verification. Who are your customers? Before you even say, move to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. So, and in terms of uh, your customer acquisition, I would say compliance does start with uh, identity verification. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I think that um, many of us face in startups, uh, my customers actually face, is really, uh, at the end of the day, access to, uh, I would say, the AML compliance digital identities, right? Um, you know, in an environment where, you know, we can potentially have, you know, 200 million or 180 million in Nigeria, and maybe even, you know, 600 million, you know, uh, to 800 million in Africa, uh, we're, we're still dealing with a fraction of that. So really the biggest challenge still is um, documentation maturity for the masses, right? Which is why we still have somewhat of um, a financial inclusion problem in Nigeria. So I think that's kind of the foundation of, you know, most of the problems is there are more, but in terms of the, you know, reducing the, the customer base, um, I would say that is the biggest challenge, just the pool of people you have to sell products to. Um, the second challenge I would say that kind of layers on top of that is, you know, and, and people have talked about it is, is the, I would say the formation of regulation or the, you know, the, the, how easy it is to access, um, some of these regulated data sets, right? So for example, um, identity is growing very fast. So in terms of the tech and the infrastructure, um, verify me, for example, you know, can, you know, give real time IDs for any government ID in Nigeria, for example, but there's, that's just the beginning of it in terms of where we're saying, you know, telling our customers who somebody is. Um, and for people to really get um, access to financial inclusion products, especially as it relates to lending, we need to go beyond the identity. Um, and it's really talking about what somebody is. And that includes their location information. So if you take location information, and this is a huge challenge to FinTech, for example, the fact that we don't have uh, I would say a policy that standardizes addressing in Nigeria, that's number one. And we don't have enforcement of um, making sure that structures have addresses actually causes billions and billions of Naira in loss, probably tens of billions of Naira in losses every year, because you already have a pool, a, 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 you know, a pool of potential customers that you cannot reach, you cannot verify their address, so you, they can't open tier three accounts or get, you know, meters or get uh, phones or get other high value products because you don't know where they are for either delivery or recovery. So that's kind of the second layer. So it's the pool, it's also kind of enforcing the regulation that strengthens the ecosystem so that um, operators like ours can get access and share that access in an open banking environment to our customers. So I would say these are some of the environments, some of the challenges. It continues to grow, really, uh, but, you know, we do have a long way to go. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're talking to investors, they say, well, how big is this? You know, I would say we haven't even, it's almost like the insurance industry in Nigeria where, you know, it's less than, I think, maybe a 1% penetration and a $1 billion uh, market. You know, the KYC, because of, you know, lack of maturity of regulation is, is almost like that, where there's still so much growth in terms of uh, establishing the ecosystem, establishing the regulation. And then the third one is actually the customers 
using or being compliant 100% of the time. Um, and I think most times it's just because of the cost of compliance. It's very difficult to be compliant with 100% of customers, but it's really a big problem um, and can cost um, some of our customers a lot of money if there is an issue. Uh, so we, I would say all in all, um, you know, the, the challenges just to summarize are uh, really the number of, uh, you know, documented uh, AML compliant identities we have, uh, regulation in the ecosystem to make sure that we have some nomenclature um, policy structures um, that could formalize, you know, how we exchange data. Um, and then I would say the 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 third one, um, you know, is is really uh, um, that um, uh, companies themselves, you know, having the the appetite, you know, to to make sure that they're compliant every single time. Um, so those are those are really the challenges, and 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 the reason that third one is really a challenge because of the cost um, sometimes of uh, the you know uh, the compliance you're trying to achieve, which is by the way why uh, Verify Me and Core ID exists um, because we're really here to bring it to bring this data to our customers faster, cheaper, um, and obviously better. Awesome, thank you very much. You know, while you were talking, just made me realize that now when you talk about companies and products and all of that, we talk about product or marketing, but it looks like you know, company is really a big deal because you can do all of that, and if you don't get it right, it affects everything, and also the cost, the cost of verifying, because the short-term cost of verifying uh might seem like a lot, but then the risk of anything happening and it's blowing out of proportion and sanctions and all of that are actually very they're very scary to think about. So, um, yeah, it's 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 something that you cannot just shrug off, um, even if it's expensive in the short run. Uh, but thank you very much, CJ, for that. Very useful. Um, so, Daluchi, um, next question will be going to you. And uh, next question is pretty much about how, like, the fintech industry, there's a lack of interoperability um, amongst African countries. So every country comes up with their own laws, you know, based on um, what they steam fits. And it can be a bit, you know, challenging for a fintech that wants to serve people around the continent, you know, in West Africa, East Africa, North Africa, every Central Africa, North Africa, and South Africa, Southern Africa. I'm curious, how do, what should fintechs are thinking about intercontinental or continental expansion? What should they bear in mind while you know, thinking about the fact that the different countries have different laws, how would you, how should they approach it? Kaluchi, I think you're muted. Uh, okay, awesome. So I think, so now you're muted, but I can't hear you. Um, but let's do it like this. So just fix, I mean, um, just work on your sound. Let me move to Michael so that we're not, yeah, so we don't. So Michael, I just work on the sound. Once we can hear you, who's that? Once we can hear you, we'll know and we'll get back to you. Uh, but just keep on trying. So Michael, over to you. Um, yeah, okay. Michael, I, I keep thinking you're going to come back. but All right, so Michael, over to you. Uh, I think my question really is, you know, how can banks, like big banks, traditional banks that are trying to get into the fintech space, um, how can they also foster that culture of compliance? Because they're competing with companies that don't really typically have fiscal presence and doing many things digital. And then the banks have to adopt a similar approach or else, you know, customers don't want to. Nobody want. I don't want to go to a bank to have to create um, an account. I just want to do it on my phone and move. So I'm curious, how can banks, how can they evolve to foster this culture of compliance? It's Michael. Oh, so you know, as um, culture, culture is is, is defined as is the way people do do things, right? Now, um, in order to to get to get all. The key players, I mean, all staff in an, in an organization to, to, to behave in a particular way. I mean, we're talking about to be um, compliant. We're looking at um, the fact that we are borrowing. We're not actually borrowing, but I mean, the fact that we are getting um, technology to drive business. So if I got your question right, you're asking 
how um, big banks can be compliant, right? In yeah, the fintech they, space. Yeah, because they are now getting into the fintech space. So it's it's they have to also factor that in. Yeah. Right. So understanding understanding um, the environment is, is very important. Because first of all, you know that you are venturing into a space that traditionally is not um, well known to, to the industry. So I'm speaking from a traditional bank perspective. Now, technology has become part of us, and whether we like it or not, casting our minds back to a few years ago when um, COVID-19 struck global. And imagine how these traditional banks could have, they wouldn't have been able to survive if um, they had not enabled technology to aid them in still delivering their services and rendering their products to, to their customers. Now, when we bring it home to, to being compliant, first of all, we need to understand and know the regulatory requirements for um, the FinTech space. Now, whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not, the same rules that govern the FinTechs are going to govern the banks. Currently, I see, I see the lines blurring out in that um, some banks are now having very solid fintech products on the market. And we can also see some fintechs, some big fintech um, companies also coming into, into banking. So the, the rules are, the, the lines are blurring out. You're gonna have banks playing the roles of fintechs, fintechs playing the role of banks. At a point, you are going to see both collaboration and competition. I mean, it's, 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 it's getting there. You either decide whether you're going to collaborate with a bank or a bank collaborating with fintech in the delivery of their service, or when we see banks rolling out products that are in, in direct competition with fintechs, it's going to, it's going to I mean, bring up um, competition. Now, these spaces are all regulated. The regulations that apply to the fintechs. When a bank wants to venture into the fintech space or when a bank is employing technology to, to drive their business, we all, the banks need to be very much aware and conscious of the regulations that govern that space. Um, I believe in every country, there may be some payment services act or regulations or directives that um, govern the, the business of, of these um, um, financial technology companies. So we need to know what, what is in there. You now do some sort of gap analysis to see where you have loose ends. Because definitely you may have in place some controls that are already um, assisting in, or like are already making you compliant with the, regulation, the regulations. But when, when you, you do the gap analysis, you'll be able to, to, to determine where you are falling short and where you need to, to, to tighten some loose ends and where you need to implement certain things in order to stay compliant. Because once you're being governed or these regulations affect you, um, the punitive measures that come with it also would affect you. So you venture into the business or into the field and you are not fully compliant. Um, you fall on the wrong side of the regulator, these sanctions and penalties would, 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 would hit you. So in wrapping up, I'll say that banks need to know what pertains in the fintech and regulatory space. Um, do their gap analysis and, and see which, which areas they fall short. And then they, they put in uh, measures to, to bridge those gaps. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, very valid. The banks also have to learn what is applicable to fintechs and just, you know, apply with it. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So your Thank response you. to the... Yeah, also. So the question about, you know, different countries having different laws and how fintechs can chase continental expansion, what do you need to think about you know, expanding to different countries? Oh, okay. All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry about the network issues. So to your, to your question, um, what do fintechs need to do um, or consider as they expand into um, different jurisdictions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, taking a cue from what Ebi said at the beginning, where he said 
um, um, fintechs need to do a lot of research. Yes, I think that's one of the key things that they, that needs to happen. Um, that research to understand what the licensing regimes um, uh, are in the jurisdiction you're trying to expand to, what um, the regulatory requirements uh, is for the kind of business that you want to do. Also, what kind of business uh, am I going to you know, um, do in this country or in this space? And uh, how does that meet the needs of the customers? And that thing to consider is how mature are these people um, or these customers for the kind of products that I'm bringing in? Um, another thing to consider would be, do I have um, counterparties you know, to support my compliance drive in these places that I'm expanding to? And the reason why you need to consider that is um, we know that technology is one of the things that drives, you know, fintechs really. And you don't want to be a fintech in a jurisdiction where there is no technology to support you. And so you 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 start to lose out on that, or you start to employ manual um, processes. One final point I would like to make is um, the need for proactive engagement with regulators before. I think everybody mentioned this too, before you, um, you know, go into this jurisdiction or even at the beginning of these um, business, you know, conversations. So engaging regulators proactively and why this is important is because we see that um, as compared to traditional banking, the regulation, regulations that exist in fintech are not as mature. And so one of the things that we see is that um, some regulators do not really understand how these things work, and that's why we see that regulation are not really, um, you know, maybe the, bids, the business and the regulations that you know, affect the business are not really in line. The proactive engagement with the regulator beforehand helps to create the understanding of the business for the regulator. It creates that platform for engagement and collaboration between the fintech and the regulator, such that by the time regulations are you know being rolled out for a certain business it's coming from a place of understanding from both the regulator side and the um the fintech side um lastly um when i say collaboration not just between the fintechs and the regulators we also need collaboration within the fintech and ecosystem so if i'm going into a country say ghana i want to talk to people who already have businesses in Ghana and say, oh, I'm about to, you know, come into this market. I know, I mean, people would not want to, you know, share business secrets or one of those things. But the thing is, these people already have experience for the markets that you're going to as a new person. So having that um, platform um, for collab collaboration helps um, you, you know, to you know, have, uh, what's, what I call it now, you have sort of an advantage. Yeah? You're not going in uh, totally blindsided. Yeah. Those, those, those are the things I think that um, fintechs need to consider as they enter a new jurisdiction. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, A.B. Um, Daluchi, sorry. Looking at A.B. Next question for him. But before I um, post, I think it's interesting to hear the, the constant, constant repetition of the fact that it's you know, people need to engage regulators before. And that's something that I think you know, is very fascinating because I, I know a popular you know, perception is, oh, it's better to <laughs> beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. But then I'm hearing you who say, <laughs> you better ask for permission first <laughs> when you beg. Yeah, because I guess the costs of, and I guess it's something open for people to debate, the costs of begging for um, forgiveness you know, is, it, <laughs> is it higher than you know, the cost of asking for permission. But yeah, very valid. It's important to ask a lot of questions if you're going to new markets. And to you, AB, now, um, you're on a fintech, um, you work at a fintech company. And one of the things that people try to do, well, fintech companies process you know, a lot of money. And there's always you know, fraud, people trying to target it. So how can fintechs fortify their internal system against fraud, cyber crime, crime money, money laundering, and other crimes that would beset a fintech company, knowing that you're a prime target. 
it's 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 a very interesting question, right? Um, uh, the amongst in, internally, right? When when we, when I speak with some people internally, some compliance guys internally that also work in one or two fintechs, right? The, the assumption is always that um, we we always laugh about it that um, it, it seems like if if it seems like your first out of your first 1000 users on every new platform like seems like like maybe 20 to 30 percent of them are fraudsters or something like that because <laughs> this it seems like fraudsters are always like the first adopters right for for every major <laughs> <that> comes <up. laughs> right <laughs> right it's a common joke within the like we just within this space um but it's a very important question that you've asked and one that um one that lots of that is very uh, pregnant to our almost all fig tanks, almost all fintechs operate today, right? Um, so how do you how do you fight how do you fight um, fraud, cybercrime, money laundering and related crimes? Firstly, you need to take your KYC seriously. Your your if you really want, if you're really serious about fighting fraud and and and, and crime, right? Um, you need to take your EML seriously. Um, you need to take your KYC seriously. You need to truly, truly know your customer, right? And knowing your customer is beyond just the ID verification that you do, right? It's it goes beyond that. You need to you need to study the pattern of customers transactions and stuff on your platform, just basically for you to understand the users properly um, before you. Uh, that that way you can get to you can get to um, at the minimum understand how they behave and you can act accordingly. Then um, something that I also see is that um, you need to take AML checks seriously. Um, spend where spends whatsoever in getting AML checks services. Um, AML checks uh, that's anti money laundering, right? Um, AML checks are not are usually not cheap. I don't know whether Verify B does AML checks for Nigerians, but uh, for Nigerian businesses. But I know that most of the companies that, most of the services that we plug into for EML checks are mostly foreign companies and they charge in dollars. These things are not cheap at all, right? And um, yeah, but like you need to like just, again, it's it's a problem for when you are a small company, you really do not want to do some of these things. So, so a lot of small tech companies rely on rely on their payment processors to, to, to do some of these checks for them, right? Again, because if you are processing monies, <clears throat> Um, you want to be sure that the you want to be sure that um, you are using payment processors that do ML checks and stuff, right? So that you don't get to pick up that cost. But by the time you get up to a certain level as a tech company and you begin to get a lot of users, um, you should take up that cost on your own and also try to understand your customers yourself, right? So take ML seriously. Um, I think I've also talked about being able to identify the final beneficiary of every transaction on your platform. Um, um, you can do this by taking the KYC process also seriously. Um, then you also need to just like, um, uh, you also need to take enhanced due diligence um, very, very serious. You have to carry out enhanced due diligence for users that are already on your platform, um, users that are already on your platform, right? So KYC is like the first step. Um, then in the, even before the user comes on, before the user gets to transact on your platform, you have to do KYC, you have to do AML checks. But while the user is even on your platform, right? If you see anything suspicious, you have to do enhanced due diligence on the user and just keep doing consistent and constant checks on the user, on the users to ensure that um, they still fit into the trench hoods that you've set for yourself compliance wise, right? Um, you also like, um, I, and this is something that, that in, in most FinTechs, right? Um, business team do not like to hear, right? As a compliance guy, you don't need to be scared about losing customers, right? Um, um, don't be scared about losing customers because, because you're asking questions around transactions or because you're asking questions um, or because you're asking, um, you're trying to do enhanced due diligence, right? Don't be scared about losing customers. Once you set your threshold, you stick to it. When you begin to manipulate your threshold and you begin to, to adjust a bit to taking certain users, that is how you, that is how you fall into a, a, a very bad trap where you know you now begin to lose sight of what your actual thresholds are, and then you can like frost frauds can pass through your system and stuff, right? So don't be scared about losing customers. One bad user can make you lose your license or even worse, like put you in jail, right? Um, you should define your threshold of what is acceptable to you as a business, right? What level of IDs do you want to collect that suits your business? Um, 
um, would you accept politically exposed persons or not, right? Would you would you accept a user that does not have a BVN or is unwilling to provide his BVN, for example, in Nigeria, right? Um, there are just lots of questions, right? Uh, would you take in cash deposits? If you are, depending on the kind of business you are, you are right, would you take in cash deposits? If you deal in foreign currencies, for example, would you accept wire transfers? If you would, which countries would you accept or reject these wire transfers from, right? What about third party payments, right? Do you plan to handle, how do you plan to handle third party payments? Would you accept monies from third parties? Would you let third parties pay into your platform, right? Um, just a lot of questions. How do you plan to handle users with multiple chargebacks? Uh, would you allow third party withdrawals, right? Third, uh, what level of authorization would you put in place if you're allowing third party withdrawals? Would, it, would you put pins? Uh, would you ask for pin? Would you put two, uh, would you ask for two factor authentication? Um, these are just a lot of the questions that you need to ask yourself, right? That would help you. These are the questions that you need to ask that would help you prevent fraud, right? And that would curb fraud on your platform, right? Uh, even as a young startup, you must try to understand that your, you must try to understand your user base quickly, right? The best way to combat fraud is by understanding patterns on your platform. So you must be agile and vibrant, right? As, as a compliance team, you must be agile, very agile and vibrant. You must look for trends and always ask questions. Um, um, be happy in public when, <laughs> when deposits are increasing exponentially. But when you are done popping the champagne with your directors bar, um, you go back and investigate the source of funds, right? And this is like something that happens like internally <laughs> all the time, right? When the numbers are shooting off the roof, everybody's happy and we are all logging ourselves that we're making so much money as a company. But as a compliance person, um, you 100% should go back and look at those numbers again and be sure that um, be sure that the monies are really monies that, that you should count as monies from your customers or monies that are useful to your business because Fraud, fraudulent money is coming through fraudulent source, or if you are being used to launder funds, right? Um, in truth, you would end up losing more than the money you've collected, right? Uh, if you allow such on your platforms, right? Um, uh, uh, it is always um, uh, it is always in the time of plenty that fraudulent transactions are difficult to notice. So you just have to absolutely be careful. Then, um, lastly, right, um, like I like to say, right, you need to employ a smart head of compliance. I know these things are. I know we cannot stress this in any way. I know it looks like I'm a compliance guy, so I, I, I'm just advocating for my people to be employed, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the absolute truth, right? Um, I, I, it's, it's. So, so something that we also like kind of just joke about a lot is that if you bring like um, five platforms on, if you bring like five different apps today, right? I can look at the apps and basically tell you the apps that, um, the apps that the head of compliance or a, a smart compliance person was working on before the, before when they designed their onboarding process and when they designed their processes and, and, and an app that, that, they didn't probably get a compliance person until like later, later or far later, right? The difference is very clear, right? To designing eyes, right, is very clear. And if you understand this space very well, you understand how fraud, how, how, how fraudsters are very smart and how they think, how, how they are fired of a lot of these conversations that, that is already ongoing, right? You would understand that you need to bring a very smart head of compliance in very early um, to be involved in the process of building your whole onboarding and your, your whole um, process flow end to end. That way yeah. you would be able to put processes in place that can combat a lot of these things. The last thing I would like to say is about uh, is on transaction monitoring, right? You just need to continue to monitor transactions and continue to keep on monitoring transactions or, uh, um, around the clock. Um, you see situations locally where you see situations locally where, um, uh, and this is something that I don't know if this is something that Verify me offers or could probably be looking to offer in the future. A lot of the transaction monitoring tools in the space today are tools that are tools that don't fit the Nigerian market. Um, there are tools that don't fit the Nigerian market. There are tools that sometimes fit just the very big banks because they want to charge big bucks. So they, they do tools that, they, 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 they model the tools after the ones in the banks and stuff, right? Um, but a small FinTech or basically FinTechs, um, internally, you need to like, uh, you need to get a smart compliance person that would understand, that would build your own internal tools or can modify whatever tool, external tool you are using to fit whatever, uh, to fit whatever you are, uh, whatever model you are trying to put on board. Thank you, Daniel. 
Thank you very much, Evi. Some compliance, people of compliance will be very grateful to you. You have just increased their chances of getting employed <laughs> by your diligent advocacy. <laughs> and, you know, I saw a CJ nodding his head to many things you are saying. We'll soon get back to you. I mean, um, um, I would definitely uh, move on to you, but let me just ask uh, Michael for this question. So I'm curious about what can, you know, big banks, you know, traditional entities, what can they teach fintechs about, you know, compliance? And also what can fintechs also teach uh, banks about like regulatory compliance, if there is anything to teach? <laughs> yeah, because the banks have been around for the longest time, so yeah. Yeah, so for the fact that um, the banks have been around, I mean, comparing the banks to the fintechs, the banks have been around relatively longer. Um, I'd like to talk about a few things. So one of them is, is the depth of KYC that we do. Um, I, I, I am a user of some you know, fintech tools or some other products. Now, um, I, I take very good notice of the onboarding process. There are some, there are some um, apps that will just ask you for, let's say, phone number and email. And then voila, you are in, you are doing whatever you want to do. But comparing that to banks, a bank will take it, its time, will take your ID, will verify your ID, it will do address verification, it will take um, some further information about, about you. You will collect, we take, um, we want to know expected transactions, um, value, volume, um, number of debits you want to be doing on an account. You know, we, we take our time to build a profile on the customer. Now, I don't, I don't see, because of, because of how the, the, the FinTech Solutions um, wants the customer to have a good experience, want the customer to, to you know, have that ease of use. Um, sometimes I see compromise on some of these very important onboarding processes and, and KYC. Um, I would also talk about the AML scrutiny. You know, just as with the banks will take, the traditional banks will take their time to build a profile on, on the customer. We are looking at screening against various sanctions lists. We have um, monitoring, monitoring tools, which would, would track transactions on an account um, based on a profile. We can determine whether um, a customer is performing transactions outside their known profile. So such transactions outside the customer's own profile will be deemed as suspicious. You will now want to zoom into those transactions and see and perform further due diligence, either enhance due diligence to ensure that the transactions are legitimate. When they are not, we have an avenue of filing suspicious transaction or suspicious, um, suspicious activity reports with the various um, financial intelligence units. So these are some of the things that I believe um, fintechs could learn from the traditional traditional banks. On the, the flip side, fintechs are agile and uh, the way they deliver on customer experience. You know, when 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 you use some some fintech apps, you can you can see that um, they were built with a customer in mind, with a customer experience. You know, has such enhanced customer experience. So on the flip side, I think traditional banks could also learn some of these things from the, from the fintechs. Backed by the good um, risk management frameworks that the traditional banks have in place, if um, much more research is, is put into um, R&D and enhancing the customer experience on the um, services and products, especially the, the apps that we offer, or have made available to our customers to use. Um, I believe that banks can learn from fintechs and fintechs can also learn from banks. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. That's, that's very insightful. You know, after you finish talking about like what fintechs can learn from bank, I'm like, would there be anything left <laughs> for, you know, banks to learn from fintechs? But it's, it's definitely like the, um, you know, user experience, because that's a thing where people don't want to, you know, don't want to do this. There's a lot of options. So it's like, oh, I don't want to go to the bank. 
And since things that would have sounded weird many years ago now sound, you know, commonsensical. Thank you very much. Very, very insightful. Uh, I can see that people are already sending in questions. Um, if you haven't, please put in your questions in the Q&A box. We'll soon be moving to ask you know, the audience. We know you have many questions for uh, awesome panelists. So please just keep on sending your questions. Um, to CJ, I see you've been nodding your head since. And uh, they've been, you know, saying many things that- I'm in agreement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, agreement. Like, yes, this is why you came here. Uh, I'm curious, and you can touch on some of the things that have been mentioned, but key question is why are identity verification companies like Verify Me, why are they critical components in addressing these challenges? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. So, you know, uh, and it's, I think I would definitely touch on uh, Ebi uh, and Michael because it's really related to uh, the questions, uh, the question that you just asked now. So going back, actually, uh, even to Ebi talking about KYC, you know, for us, you know, at uh, Verify Me and at Core ID, uh, which is our B2B brand, we don't see a separation between identity, the identity verification, the AML check, um, the consumer analytics. Uh, in fact, what we tell our customers is you can know more about your customer at the point of onboarding. There's no reason why. You cannot have, you know, the, the identity verified, have some kind of financial profiling, do an AML check, um, check, you know, a, a, a criminal background, you know, for any flags, for anything that can be reported, all in seconds at the same time. And I guess this is why, by the way, Verify Me is here, because we are really here to link businesses to the trusted identities, but also to the data, functional data associated with those trusted identities. So, we're fast approaching a time where there's really no separation about uh, you know between you know all these types of checks it's not just about identity for kyc companies anymore especially when we talk about going beyond identity going beyond apis really this is what we mean in terms of not not telling our customers just who somebody is but we really are at this point telling our customers what somebody is and I think that we need to have a lot more socialization and engagement with the industry um, and with our customers and even customers to be right to show them that uh, there really is uh, a space for us to provide so much more powerful KYC for them, where they don't have to do so much. They can focus on their core business and let an operator like Core ID um, do um, a lot of the KYC work for them. So that's kind of uh, the first, you know, one of the things I want to touch on. And it's important, like no, no fintech is going to stop doing their internal an analytics. However, Internal analytics can't compare to uh, an operator like Verify Me that's sharing data across the industry. So, for example, you know we have maybe you know twelve of the top twenty uh, insurance companies in Nigeria. Well, somebody can be doing uh, analytics, you know, to uh, internally, you know, to see if this person is a risk. But if we're sharing data with all these companies, we can tell you whether that person has already been a risk in another place, right? And this is what individual companies can never, never get. And I always say this, the KYC is most effective when it's federated. And I mean that when they're across the board, right? You can link repositories and databases together to bring data, turn data into information for your customer. And not one individual company can do it. So I just, I want to link that back then. Go actually to what Michael said, because it's so key. Um, I think the risk profiles that banks have is something that fintechs, you know, really, really uh, can learn from them. And we work with a lot of banks, uh, actually more than 50% of uh, the commercial banks in Nigeria signed up with us. And we know for a fact that they're very cautious, but then there's also a need for speed. And really another thing I think maybe we want to, what's the word, proselytize, for lack of a better word here, is that you don't have to give up one for another anymore, um, especially with, you know, core ID technology. You can literally open, you know, tier three accounts in, you know, in seconds many times, meeting all your um, KYC requirements. Uh, you know, you can, and so this is why you talk to, you know, we would love to talk to a lot of, um, and this is why it's actually why we're having this event and we would love, love to talk to a lot of our partners. So the era um, of, you know, uh, giving up speed for uh, compliance or giving up, com you know, compliance for speed is, is definitely, um, you know, antiquated, you know, really for us now. Um, and we can bring those solutions that uh, give our customers speed 
and full compliance at the same time. So I'm really looking forward to talking to every everyone, um, you know, about about you know the more powerful things we can do. Now, the final part of the question, you know, to really say is, you know, why is digital identity so important? You know, and we've said this a few times. I always, you know, funny enough, I think I always say this on, on the Digital ID Matters uh, webinars that we have is, and it's, you know, I think it's important for, I think, the ecosystem to, 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 to get. The, the road we are trying to get to at the end of the day uh, with compliance in mind is really an open economy, open finance, open economy. And the reason the digital identity is so important that it's the compliance is the foundation for all of that, right? In order to send money, you need to know who's sending it and who's delivering it. And we look at it as a four stack, uh, I would say four, four levels or four stacks, four stack technology, right? Where identity is really the, the layer. But, you know, even looking at, you know, uh, comparative or comparable countries, you, in order to get to data as a service, you're going to need to go through identity. You're going to go th need to go through payments. Um, and it is the, um, the attributes of payments, the volume, veracity, variety, value, all those things that you uh, start to analyze that gets you into the third layer, which is your data science um, and AI level that actually is able to power alternative uh, scoring for banks, traditional, you know, all the uh, algorithms and building that and products you're going to do that's going to now get you to the fourth layer, which is actually the lending. So the reason identity and companies like Verify Me and we are so important as really one of the leaders in Africa's biggest economy, Nigeria, is so important is that we are literally fintech enabling. Um, and the products we build on top of our identity are literally uh, financial inclusion enabling. Um, and so this is why we're so important to the overall ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's that's very, very, I know the point about, you know, you having ac access to multiple um, companies and being able to cross check. That's the thing where, you know, someone can <laughs> do something here and just because of that lack of interoperability, just go to that place and start on a clean slate. Exactly. And that's that's definitely like a difference because companies are not usually, I mean, we're not, trust level is not that high that they would share with themselves, but the third party who is neutral happy to do that so that, that's <laughs> like a big deal actually um yeah thank you very much so i see the questions coming in please keep them coming after this, this next question to dalichi would start taking questions from the attendees but to dalichi i know that you know earlier you know, ab had mentioned you, know, you made a point about how like for every point every compliance or kyc point it could also be a drop off point for a customer and you know my question is how do you sort of balance uh, from your experience how have you seen you know, balancing you know customer needs you know with risk management how do you do this such that you don't lose customers because you know someone can just vex and say ah this form is too long <laughs> i don't want to do it again or how much is it self that we're doing so i'm curious how 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 can fintechs or how do you see them approaching this such that you don't lose um, customers and it's also still yeah okay yeah so um that's a very um, important question um i think that the the thing is that when people hear compliance they're just like ah, these people need to shut up my business that's the way volume uh, um, the, first, the initial reaction to compliance okay yeah no it's just louder a bit yeah i can hear you but yeah Oh, okay, okay. Is this okay? Just continue, don't worry, it's fine. All right. So I was saying, yes, that um, the first thing to do in balancing customer um, needs and risk management is a risk assessment, basically. So um, what is my risk appetite as a, a fintech? What, um, where, in what areas does my business face, you know, the highest risk or where, 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 where am I prone to risk the more? And so asking yourself that question now helps you, you know, factor in the fact that all oh, your customers want a seamless onboarding experience. They want um, 
products that they can onboard with very fast. They want um, secure, you know, platforms. They, they, they want to provide their debt data to you or their information to you and be sure that they're not going to have to worry about it. And they generally want a very good experience through and through. And so as a business, you want to provide your customers that. But at the same time, you also know that there is the risk that these things pose. So how do you now um, you know, cushion it? So I think the first thing I would say is, I mean, for us to exist as a business, yes, we have to balance out the risk because if if um, if our if our, if we let our customers you know, have all the way, you know, people say, oh, customer is king and this that that, but we also have regulators, and then there's there are laws. There are guidelines that we have to comply with as a business. So what would I say, um, what, what do I think we need to do as fintechs to balance that out is um, as much as you want to provide seamless onboarding experience to your customers, um, how do you, you know, take advantage of technology, you know, to take to, um, you know, include KYC, customer identification, verification, in a way that it also still provides a good experience to your customer. How can you, you know, ensure that your platform is secure, you know, for their for the data that they provide is, you know, is secure and people's phones that they place with you are secure. You don't have fraud starts coming in. How do you, you know, include all that? Also, in terms of the products that you make available to these customers, oh yes, your products are innovative, you know, they are really meeting customers' needs, but are you, you know, are the right customers coming to onboard on that product? Are you providing that service to people who qualify, you know, for it? And how do you know that? Okay, so I'm onboarding. Um, I think that's what they call tier, you know, in the bank, in traditional banking, you have tier one, tier two, tier three. So yes, that's something we need to learn as fintechs too, and, you know, put into our platform. So at tier one, we have a limited amount or a limited service offering for that um for, for, for that and then because of how limited or how low risk that product is we're able to take okay just we're able to take an acceptable level of kyc for that and then as you progress we start to ask you know uh, what's the name more questions we start to you know um build a bigger profile for you yeah, for for the customer i think those, those, those are um, a few ways we can do that generally we understand you know i mean as a compliance person um um i'm i'm the middle person between my business my regulator and my customer i mean we are in business because of the customer but we're also in business because my regulator lets us you know be in business and so finding a way to you know balance that out, keep my business um, as a, keep my business as a going concern while also providing um, you know customers great experiences what makes my job really um, you know <laughs> difficult in a sense. but then I think that these ways that I've mentioned the risk assessment, a, um, a, um, you know matching the right products with the right customers, um, taking advantage of technology in, you know, um, in implementing KYC and AML requirements and all that would help, you know, provide that balance. Right. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you very much, Daluchi. That's very insightful hearing about the different tiers because uh, many of times people join platforms or join, you know, um, use apps and then they don't want to do the most, you know, they're just want to come on board and do something basic and you know it's not it's useful to not bombard them with asking them for everything <laughs> and they need to provide and interestingly children k who i'm not sure what he does but he's just giving us i suppose what's <laughs> some of the requirements for tier one but yeah i think i'm familiar with that but it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind because while we have to it's like the different stakeholders it's the customer that you want to have and there's a regulator that you're accountable to and then you have to sort of um, appease or lack of better words yeah put parties but thank you very much for that Daluchi. 
Um, see the questions are still coming in. Thank you, everyone. Um, keep them coming in. So before we go to the Q and A, taking questions from the audience, I just like to you know mention again that uh, you know this is a conversation about uh, digital identity and also how it's important to have the right use work with the right partners, use the right tools to ensure that you're on track and you're compliant. And then if you're looking for business looking for a trusted identity system that offers customer analytics and much more, you should check out Core ID by Verify Me. I know the platform helps you carry out onboarding, sales, compliance, um, checks and ensure that you're in place. Whether you're a commercial bank, you know, FinTech, you know, you're just a money lender, lending company, insurance, telco, or any other thing, it's very important to do that. And you know, interestingly, one of the things that AB said was many of these products are that he checked, some of them don't meet the needs of startups or they're very expensive. But you know, Core ID, you know, which was rebranded, they thought about this and said, hey, we want to be able to meet small businesses because um and fintechs who are going to grow to become really big businesses tomorrow. So definitely you should check it out. My colleague um who is Chatru Moderator would share the links and share more information in the chat box so you can easily just um, check it out. And of course, on your screen there, you're seeing the URL for you to check it out. So awesome. So that, that's about it. Now we move to the questions. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, let me see, who do I start with now? Okay, some of these questions are... Okay, let me just start with some of them are together. Okay, I see there are two questions. Let me start with you. Uh, the first one is verify me working in any French African countries. I say if you're not funny, but that's one, just pull that. Okay. Uh, and uh because because so what do you think? So as regards um, using digital identity in providing health services to newborns and children, what do you think is the roadmap the Nigerian government can implement in ensuring a good play uh, of the use of digital identity in accessing digital services across different sectors? Uh, this is a lot of questions, but just how can the Nigerian government you know, implement this, especially uh, you know, when you starting early, you know, starting from newborns and children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and I think some of that is already being done, actually, you know, and we're aware of this because um, we're regulated by many government agencies, we work with government, so we, we keep abreast of uh, a lot of um, what they're doing. So number one, I think people have noticed the past few years, there's been a lot of talk about harmonization. And you see a lot of regulation coming out where uh, you cannot get your passport, you cannot get your driver's license. And those are kind of like the, you know, the harmonization and dealing with the uh, adult level stuff. So a lot of regulation is coming out to make sure that um, the national identity is used um, across the board for, you know, as and linked to functional identities um, so that people can uh, either drive, you know, or get access to services. Now, one of the things people actually don't know is there is a process for um, children, uh, you know, uh, newborns to actually get a national ID. And yes, there is actually, and uh, very, very few. In fact, right now, um, Verify Me um, is actually uh, partnered with uh, some states, and one of the states we're in, in Edo State, we're helping power the Edo State ID, is we are actually enrolling, because apart from being an ID verification uh, services company, which is, you know, the huge business we have, we actually um, are licensed to document Nigerians as well. Uh, and we are doing so in schools, um, you know, um, helping the state as well. But there is a process with the, it's called, there's a, um, the national um, uh, agency that manages births and deaths in Nigeria, actually a births actually, um, now works with NIMSI. Um, so your, your a birth can be registered um, and you can actually get a NIN um, for your child, which is linked to the parent. Um, a lot of times, sometimes they may collect the biometrics. Um, and that's actually managed until the minor is 18 years old. I believe they collect the biometrics again because, you know, biometrics um, change for minors. So there is a process. So, but one thing is, is having a process, 
Um, and then the second thing is the uh, the application of that process. So I think where we're still growing uh, in Nigeria, for example, is you know applying the process that already already exists to make sure that um, newborns and minors get access to their NIN. Uh, but you're going to see an, an explosion of it, particularly because, you know, we love to travel. Um, and as people can get their passports, including minors and all, um, we plan to see, you know, we think that there's going to be a lot more NINs. One thing to note about um, documentation of Nigerians, if you look at the NIN number in the past two and a half years, they have gone from 30 million about two and a half to three years ago to almost 90 million um today so i think that's a successful number uh and you know of course it can be maybe almost double but uh you know it's it's really a lot of growth in terms of you know where where things have come from how about very me working in any african fintech africa so french african countries Yes, of course. So, um, you know, the our what our critical infrastructure countries are Nigeria and Ghana, um, where we um, really provide very robust um, direct sourcing um, for um, for our customers. Um, and one of the things, you know, I think maybe we should also discuss is it's, you know, with very family, we have a law, right? We, it's goals law. And you can't build a complex system at once. Um, you have to build simple systems and eventually put them together and they become complex. And I think a lot of us are under this pressure to put all Africans on one endpoint mm. for the most part, right? Um, and, you know, after over two decades in living in other countries, I have never seen another continent um, where there's so much pressure to have hundreds and hundreds of millions of people on one endpoint. Right. Uh, when those countries have not even built their own individual structures um, and 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 those countries are entitled to their own customized KYC, like every other country in the world has. But we're somewhat under pressure to have the same so that it's easy um, for us to be on one endpoint. So um, I challenge that. Um, and I and I, I advise you know operators um, to make to make sure that you know we understand that KYC is also cultural, um, and we need to customize it for the people themselves you know so that we can bring their their best uh, credit worthiness to them as well. So because of that, um, we do have extensions for francophone countries for sure. Um, but what I what I will say, um, there's still a lot of groundwork to do in individual countries, and hopefully in the future, what we're going to see is a lot of collaboration, um, so that operators um, and owners of uh, the ecosystem um, and uh, indigenous companies are able to really own um, the KYC industry in their countries, because at the end of the day, data is a national security asset, and every country in Africa needs digital sovereignty. So, um, you know, that's where we, we would keep it. And But to answer the last question is, we do have a francophone extension for you. This is why we launched Core ID. Um, and Core ID is the Africa-wide solution that actually brings identity uh, and uh, analytics uh, to our customers beyond Nigeria. So I would love to talk to whoever is asking about that as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very interesting point about, you know, um, you know, different countries having theirs and not, I mean, we'll, we'll be saying we're one Africa, so I mean, it'd be nice to have everything together, but <laughs> 54 countries, so um, definitely it's very diverse, but thank you very much, CJ. Um, so this question I'll direct it to Michael. Uh, <laughs> this is asking, what if you carry out extensive research before entering a jurisdiction and you you find out that the space or particular business is not regulated. Do you still need to meet with regulators? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll say that um, <laughs> it wouldn't be entirely that a space is, is not regulated. So in Ghana, for example, um, recently the central bank has issued a directive. It's kind of a sandbox for innovation. Regulator is ready to, to work with um, people, fintechs, whichever um, company you, you belong to once you are in the tech space. And they even state, stated that whether what you're doing falls within the regulatory limits or not. So um, once it has to do with um, a particular service, usually, uh, let me say, if, if it has to do with anything financial, there's definitely going to be a central bank. 
in order to play safe, I'd advise that you engage some regulators and then try and find your feet. Definitely, there would be something that would apply to you. There, there's no unregulated um, or totally unregulated space. There's, there may be some intersections or, or tangents that you may touch with some other spaces that would have some regulation. So in order to play safe, and then not, 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 to, not to fall on the wrong side of, 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 the, of the law, I'd advise that, especially when you find yourself in the financial space, engage the central bank. If there's any um, area that will point you to, you'll do that. Right, thanks. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. That's a very, that's a good professional response. Um, you know, still engage. So you're hearing it, so it's still go. Go and ask. And yeah, it, it's very valid. The chances, those are the chances of there being no regulation. Um, yeah, there could be, but he's saying just go so that you would know that you they came and like Abi had earlier said, after you talk, <laughs> send the <laughs> send the mail of what you said and all of that, so that they won't say you didn't come. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's never valid. So these next two questions I would direct that Daluchi is not, <clears throat> and I don't know if you know can respond to it, but two questions. First is, you know, can a microfinance share its license to multiple fintechs? I don't know if you know the answer to that, but and it looks like a question for you know regulator. Then there is the is it necessary to communicate to CBN if a microfinance bank allows you to partner with them to use their license? Um, yeah, I don't know if you. It's not, but it's about the space and you know compliance. Um, can a microfinance share its license to multiple fintech, and is it necessary to communicate to CBN if a microfinance bank allows you to partner with them to use their license? Um, Daluchi, do you have any thoughts on that? Da, da, da. If you're talking and unmuted, or did you get me, Daluchi? Uh, you're muted. Okay, so I would just, I'm not sure, maybe she can hear me. Um, but I'm curious if anybody else has a response to that, or we should just leave it. I tell them to ask CBN for the answer to this. Hello, anybody hear me? I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I can hear you. So I'm curious if there's something about microfinance um, sharing its license to multiple fintechs and you know communicating with CBN if you get a license to partner. Um, is that uh, any any thoughts on that? Um, okay, so I I I don't have um, a definite answer to that to be honest because I have not really researched um, researched deeply into into that right um but i know that a lot of a lot of a lot of players in this space today most especially tech companies do not some not, let me not say a lot but some of them do not own the microfinance bank licenses that they use right so i would reckon that um that it does allow it uh, right again it depends on a lot depends on how you structure how you structure the partnership and the relationship right um for you to have a wallet service for you to have a wallet um service for you to hold monies customers funds um you must have some sort of license from the cbn or you must partner with somebody that has the license right and what that means in the true sense of it is that somebody with a license must must be the one holding the money you don't have the right to hold the money so you might just be what you might just be displaying to the general public is a front right as like just um they might just be seeing that they pass the funds to you but in the true sense of it right the actual funds would be sitting with a with a licensed with a cbn licensed um, um entity right i hope that answer suffices yeah, thank you. That's useful. And yeah, there's only so much we know. So whoever asks ask those questions, please um, <clears throat> take it to the regulators. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's also the point of, you know, just you being front face, but it's still sitting in, you know, the account of it, banks. You know, so that way it's, it's you're still compliant in a sense. Um, all right. Um, thank you very much. 
Um, so there's a question about um, how can we hmm, how can we incorporate the identity and AML verification in app development, especially at the point of onboarding? Um, I don't fully understand that question because I don't know how it works, but um, I can anybody... try. Okay. <laughs> Do I can try. Yeah, I think it's, it's <laughs> you know, I think, I think, let me, I have a one, two, a few words answer to that, two words, call us, right? Uh, and <laughs> that's how, you, that's how you can apply it. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll make it very easy for you. I think it's, it's four easy steps uh, and you can apply it. And it's, 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 you know, when you build apps, the only thing I say, you know, that we also need to change a little bit is, you know, um, a lot of people, you know, say that, you know, they are building for um, developers, and you know this might this might sound controversial, um, but unless you are a developer that has a license to operate, right, um, for the access that you the data that you're you're asking for, right, um, you shouldn't get that access. That's the regulation, and that's where even NDPR comes in. So if you're a developer that has that you know access or right then you're a business so i always say to you know you know in verify me is we are building um for people who are building products we're building for businesses for service providers uh, but we're making sure that great engineers and great developers who work in those companies love our technology um, and want to use our systems um, so what I would say is, how can you incorporate digital identity is, well, you be compliant yourself in terms of uh, being a registered company that, you know, uh, has the, uh, the right to access that data, and then call Core ID, and we'll get that for you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, CJ. Um, that's awesome. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's very, I believe, you know, the developer, the person asked who asked the question understands the response to it. Yeah, but very useful points shared there. Um, so I'm going to ask Daluchi a direct question to you next. Next, however, Michael, Michael Odo. So we want to try to see, you know, if you can ask your question live. So Michael, if you're available, just um, get ready. Let me know if it's fine to unmute your mic. So you can ask your question live. Um, so, Dalichi, so Jane here asks, she says that there needs to be a balance between traditional compliance method and new fintech method. Um, I believe what she means, like the virtual method. And she says that traditional banking compliance system is more, effect, is more effective, however, it's time tasking. And on the fintech method, it's faster, but lack of accurate KYC. So it's like, Problem is how can we find a balance? Um, do you? I mean, what do you think about this and uh, find the balance? Okay. Um. Thank you. Um. First of all, please confirm you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you. Awesome. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So um, I think I spoke a, a bit on that when I responded to your question about um, balancing customer needs and risk management. Yes. So just to um, provide more context, yes, I mean, um, it's, it's obvious, even when uh, Michael spoke about what fintechs could learn from traditional banks and what traditional banks learn from fintechs, they also touched on this. So yes, we know um, that there's a there's traditional banks are doing more thorough KYC, especially just at the point of onboarding. I mean, you, you take a look at what account opening packs look like. They are literally asking you the entire thing. But the thing is, um, with fintech and with technology and with the kind of experience we're trying to provide to our customers. Um, I think where 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 what we can do is also part of what I mentioned earlier about a risk profiling for the kind of customers that we are we are onboarding. So and then the risk profiling based on the customer type, 
based on the type of product I'm offering you, that will now determine the level of KYC that I'm going to require for you to provide to me before I can onboard you. And then because I now have technology to leverage, instead of having to hand you a booklet of forms to fill, you're able to provide that information I verify on the go in minutes. So that's, that's just the thing. It's... Um, um, and I mean, banks also apply this in the tiered nature of um, you know accounts, and that's something that fintechs can also imbibe. So, and then we need to, I, I mean, apart from just doing it, we need to enforce it. You know, we need to be sure that you know there are no leaks. Is implement a KYC process that is strong, that is um, standard. If I'm going to move from the point A to point B then these are the requirements. Communicate that clearly to your customers. When Ebi was speaking earlier, I think he spoke about, um, you know, monitoring. Yes, yeah, not just, you know, KYC doesn't just happen at the point where you onboard and end there. So as I monitor your, my customers and I see a, what's the name, um, a difference in the kind of profile that you provided to me at the beginning and what, you know, is existing now, then it's, it's on me, you know, to go ahead and say, okay, I need to redo this KYC. I need to do enhanced due diligence. I need to update, you know, the information that you've provided to me based on, you know, what you gave me earlier and considering your current um, profile. And that way we can, you know, um, ensure that we are maintaining or we have accurate KYC for our customers per time. I think that's a way to, to balance it out on the fintech uh -huh. side. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, very insightful. You know, customer you know, profile will help determine you know, how to um, ensure that they are compliant and also match them with what they are doing. Thank you very much, Davichi. And uh, Michael, are you ready to speak? Right. Um, good afternoon. Afternoon, Michael. Confirm that you can hear. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, the session has been quite exciting. I must thank you, all the panelists. You guys are awesome. So um, I just have two questions. One for ECK, ECK. So when you were speaking about the challenges in FinTech around the identi identity verification, you mentioned something about documentation maturity. I would like you to speak more to that. I maybe I missed it. I need to understand what you mean by that. And then to Abi, maybe you, you, you know, in, you said that you know you can look and look at an app able to spot out which one has a smart compliance officer. You know that as part of the development team or, or part of those who worked on this pro on the product. So I, I'd like to know. What are the things, what are the outliers, what are the things that you look out for? Because I'm a project manager, I'm a product manager, and I, I need to know, know these things so that in building my product, I can also, you know, get these things incorporated or in, in, imputed in my, in my development. Thank you. All right. Uh, I guess I'll just go quickly um, on that. So when I say documentation maturity, thank you for your question, by the way. So let me clarify. Um, digital documentation, uh, you know, when we talk about it is in this context, um, for me, the way I use it and the way we use it in industry is the, the act of um, documenting uh, in Nigerians um, uh, biometric data um, and, and bio data uh, so that um, it can be a, an unchangeable AML compliant trusted identity. So when I say maturity, I mean it looking at it from the context of the country is that, um, you know, when I was talking about the challenges, if you are, for example, Nigeria, you know, if you look at us three years ago, um, where population of almost 200 million, with 30 million documented uh, digitally, that is what we will consider low maturity, right? Um, perhaps maybe we're getting more uh, much closer to intermediate now, but when we say maturity, it's really um, a, 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 a digital identity ecosystem, a national digital identity ecosystem 
where people are getting their national IDs, you know, almost, you know, very easily in an automated way. Your ability to get it, you know, is, you know, just a few days. In most countries, you apply and you pretty much just get it in the mail uh, immediately. So we still need to get to that point where um, it's, you know, asking somebody, do you have a NIN um, is not a strange thing. In fact, you will be shocked, you know, when the person says no. Uh, you know, so for example, you know, I can tell you in many countries, I've, uh, you know, some countries I've never seen or met someone who's, who doesn't have a social security number. Um, for example, that is kind of documentation maturity, uh, digital, you know, ID documentation maturity. So that's, that's kind of what I mean in that space. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Um... Um, normally, I get paid to answer questions like this because you ask <laughs> to release the source of <laughs> right. But um, just to like just to talk about it um, at the surface level, right, and not to go too deep, right. Um, so, if you take just an average app and you are going through the onboarding process, um, when you see an app where they ask you for so many unnecessary questions, again, you have to first of all try to understand the space where the app, where what the the space the app is playing in, and try to understand what would be what what are, what is the goal, what are they trying to achieve by asking all of these questions, right? Um, if you so, if you see an app that is asking for just a bunch of questions and you just, you know what the goal they are trying to achieve. And you know that they, they need to ask all of these questions to achieve all of these goals. They are try, over, obviously over, um, trying to over overcompensate, right? Um, you just know that this is something that was not done by, uh, if it was done by a compliance person, it wasn't done by a very smart one, right? Um, if you also like, you see that um, you see in the KYC process today, um, even by using people like Verify Me, right? Um, you see that you can pr probably use one step. You can just use one step to kill off many of the other items that you normally would have asked for, right? In your in your compliance process, right? In your onboarding process. But when you see some apps where they just keep going in on just asking, just creating so many layers and stuff, right? And you just see that oh, you you've passed one step that. If they had done A, B, C, D, and E on this step, they would not need to do or to require A, B, C, D, and E, F, J up to, do you understand? Like stuff like that, you just get to know that, yeah, so something is missing obviously in, in this space, right? So these are things that mostly compliance guys know about, right? And try to fit into the onboarding process uh, uh, than when uh, um, just a, a developer or a tech guy Right, it's basically just building the app, and it just feels like oh, it goes online and it googles and it sees that you require name, bio data, and all of that, and just fill all of that in, and without taking into cognizance some of these things that could have made the process simpler and easier across the line. Right, yeah, a few more, but um, yeah, let's just stop at that for now. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank I'm you. So sorry, um, Michael, just. And um, Daniel, just add um, a little bit to what um, Abby said in response to Michael's question. So, Michael, um, one way you can you know, help with your question is to carry your compliance team along right from the time you start building. Um, there's something called compliance by design, where um, as you build, yes, you have a compliance person who you know provides advisory to you to say, okay, these are the things that you, you need to put in, you need to include in your product uh, at this step, at that step, and as you go. So sometimes compliance people just get to learn about these things after the products have you know been completed. But then if you carry them along, um, these gaps that Debbie mentioned will be closed. You do it as you build and then you arrive at the what's the name, the finish line together. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's very insightful. The fact that you need to carry out, like you need to car carry along many people, you know, from the beginning. So that designers will say carry us along. Everybody say so marketing say carry us along. So carry everyone along from the beginning so that you wouldn't have these issues. But thank you very much, Daluchi. Um, two quick questions because they're almost out of we're out of time basically. So Lucas is asking which alternatives to selfie and photo ID for KYC are out there? Um, Europe, uh, Europe question my privacy. What are P 
PEP tools should what to PEP tools what are PEP tools suitable to our new international embargo world system? And it is is it not just it is not just for lending, but more importantly, services and investments. I don't understand the question, but I think it's um, but just hold it there. The second one I want to just add quickly, which is more to AB, is something about you know. Um, the need to identify um, the final, final, final beneficiary and third-party payments. What measures can you put in place to manage third-party payments? Um, so, Abi, I'm sure you understand what that means. But the first one is that something that we understand. Alternatives to selfie and photo ID for KYC. What yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, it, it. So it it really depends on your use case. Um, and it's this is almost an exciting. It's it is an ex exciting question because we literally just put out a platform that allows our customers to build their own. It's like a workflow creator, right? So it's whether you want it. First of all, it depends on what technology is available in your e ecosystem. So a lot of like in Europe, OCR is really big, uh, where it's not a direct ID verification. What's OCR? Well, OC OCR is basically um, doc reading the, the, the ability to read the document, the, um, the ID. Oh, yeah. Um, and then uh, exactly and then on layered on top of that sometimes there's some ai to actually tell you whether that id is, is real or fake now in the nigeria ecosystem funny enough apis are actually more online and more available um than in many you know developed countries you know where they have uh ids distributed um so a lot of times rather than using ocr or documentation they use um live id verifications now with photo matching, you know, you didn't say liveness. So I would say for us, the best alternative and actually more secure, um, you know, or I would say spoof free um, is really a liveness um, alternative where uh, customers, many of our customers use um, for remote, uh, remote account services so that you can open an account and you don't have to go into the branch. Um, these are really um, very much very highly secure um, and spoof free. So um, we in in the uh, Nigeria ecosystem, we we say that liveness is the best um, alternative to um, photo matching. Uh, optical character recognition right now um, we do not have. I saw somebody just posted that, um, and but I'm sure that the, as the market evolves, um, you know we're still dealing with unbanked and a very rudimentary market for the most part um, as we talk in Africa. So a lot of times the technology has to be appropriate, uh, but I would say definitely liveness, um, and we're going to bring more and more as the situation arises. But liveness check, I would say. Thank you very much. Um, before the next question, which I'd said, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to have a poll come up now, you know, just so my team will put the poll so you can fill the poll, answer a few questions, and we'll see the results um, in a bit. So yeah, while you're filling that, so this question about what measures to put in place to manage third party payments. I know while, you know, I mentioned, you know, AB, Michael and Dalichi, feel free to chip in, uh, but yeah. What measures can you put in place to manage third party payments? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, what SCG did not mention was that liveness test is more expensive and it's better for his company, right? <laughs> when, when their companies do liveness tests, <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> um, Okay, so talk about third party payments, right? Um, again, it depends on your it depends on the service you are trying to provide. Um, if you're a digital bank, you obviously cannot do without third party payments. You you can't say you're a digital bank and not pay to third parties, right? Um, so what measures can you put in place? You just need to you need to um you you hundred percent need to uh, make your processes tighter. Um you need to make your processes tighter. You need to probably uh, not just set pins, but also um, to factor authentication and, and stuff around the security of the platform, right? Because it, the fear with third party, the major fear with third party, um, with third party payments, it's what if your account is, is hijacked from you and somebody transfers money out without your, without your CISO, right? So you need to like, platforms need to, ensure that there are two-factor two, two authentications, there are pins, and if possible, there are other um, questions that are being asked at the point at which you are making these transactions. Again, I know you, you want to balance ease, ease, of, uh, uh, ease of using the platform along with the compliance checks, but again, um, you just need to look at look at the amounts that are lost on, on, on an annual basis that banks, that 
um, number of trans fraud transactions that happens in banks on, on an annual basis to know that this is like a very, very big deal, right? So um, you just need to take all of that into cognizance. And um, then for final beneficiaries, how do you identify final beneficiaries? First of all, you need to first of all identify who is your customer, right? As in like, who is your customer? It is when you identify who your customer is, then you can more or less like know who the final beneficiary is, right? Again, I would say that it depends on the market you're playing in. I would use a digital, I would use an investment platform as, far, as an example, right? For example, in Bamboo where I work, right? We currently do not allow third party payouts, right? Because again, it's an investment platform and, and, and stuff like that. So our final beneficiary must be, right? The person that must be the person that opened the account originally, right? Um, so you can't give me the BVN for, for Mr. A and when time comes to liquidate or you want to withdraw, you tell me to pay to Mr. B, it, it doesn't add up, right? Um, but when you look at it from a digital bank, digital banking perspective, right? Um, the final beneficiary could be a third party in this case, but who is being KYC and who is determining the final beneficiary is who you would need to pay special attention to, which in this case, you must always ensure that you've put things in place that would ensure that, uh, to ensure that it is your actual customer that is the one making the transaction at that point in time. Awesome. Uh, Michael, did you want to add anything? <clears throat> well, to, to, to add a few words to what um, David just, just said, um, so he rightly mentioned that um, you need to uh, ensure the, that the level of control. So control here is, I'm not talking about the security control, but when it comes to third party payments, because in some instances, the, the beneficiary is not within your control. So you, have, you need to make sure that the, the level of security on the application is, is, is very high or tight. Because once sometimes once the money moves out, you in order to and you you need to let's say put a block of fees on it. You now have to go through some other um, long processes. And sometimes by the time you are able to to get your, your work through that, hey, this money was fraudulently moved, the beneficiary would have taken it out of the accounts. Now, when it comes to knowing who the, the final beneficiary is, in some instances you realize that the beneficiaries are. Um, okay, bringing it, bringing it to, to Ghana, for example, third party payments could be a bank to bank or a bank to wallet or a wallet to bank or a wallet to wallet. Um, due to some level of interoperability in, in our system, you would be able to tell who owns the wallets that receive the funds. You can even really run the number through your, your system and able to generate the name on the wallet. That is one. Now, um, if it's a bank account, definitely it's going to another bank. And then this beneficiary would have been thoroughly KYC'd by the bank in which the account sits, right? So these are some of the ways that we're able to identify um, the, the beneficiaries in third party payments. And also um, the level of control, just because you are not in full charge of, 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 the, of the accounts, you need to ensure that your controls are uh, good cyber security wise, um, I think we haven't mentioned much, we haven't talked about much about cyber security, but when it comes to um, fintechs and payment applications, cyber security is a very important um, aspect that we cannot, we cannot go without. Thank you very much. Dalit, anything? Good. I mean, the speakers before me have um, um, you know, spoken about talked about it extensively um just to reiterate something that he kept on saying with third party payments um primarily your your own customer is who you have control over you don't really have as much control on the beneficiary and so um ensuring that you have kyc adequate controls in place on your app Cyber security, like um, Michael just mentioned, are things that um, you 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 need to put in place on an advanced level. Um, sometimes, and I mean this this can come in depending on the how the transaction flow is and um, what the dynamics of the particular transaction is. Questions like 
you know, the purpose for that transaction, especially where it doesn't make, you know, uh, business sense just by looking at it. You know, you want to ask for that or you want to confirm, is this really you initiating this transaction? Um, is there something that you can provide to us, like documentary evidence for this or one of those things? And that way, just to, you know, put extra checks on what you have already done for your own customer. Um, having the details of the beneficiary is enough, but then, um, I mean, that's as much control as you can get because the beneficiary is really you know, not within you and you'd have to ask really another um, uh, entity you know, to give you that information. But your own customer is really where you need to really, um, ensure that all your controls are tight. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Tadichi. And at this point, we'll be wrapping up the conversation. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining, for speakers, Michael, Taluchi, AB, and CJ. Thank you for joining us. And uh, while I think the poll is still up, but my colleague would also be sharing the post events of post event survey. We want to know what you thought about this event and how we can do better. And um, please, the link will be shared in the chat room. So let's just fill our post event survey. It shouldn't take more than two minutes tops. And of course, thank you very much in Nigeria for you know supporting this event put together. Um, it's very very insightful learning about um, you know identity and compliance and all of that. So from the last point, it just occurred to me that oh, this is why you know for many of the apps I use when you want to send money, it's always first to my account first. And I never really thought much about it. I mean, I figured there was some, but now I see why you know this whole third party. <laughs> Um, then it's it's really a big deal. So you've often given more context to you know how many people would um, use or think about the interaction with their different apps. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you everyone. And you know once again, it's been said many times, but uh, the many points have been raised about the importance of compliance, about KYC and all of that. And you know the folks are verifying me have taken all of that data together and decided to package that into Core ID, which is like a new product, a rebranded product, which is to serve um, customers, fintechs, um, lenders, everyone, and ensuring that you have faster, faster customer onboarding, onboarding real-time analytics, amongst other things. The link will post it in the chat room again. Um, and as usual, it would be, yeah, as usual, you can see it's on the screen. So you can see all of this and you, yeah. So check it out, reach out to them. As the CJ has said, you know, two words, call us, and you know, they'll be happy to answer your question. This has been very enlightening. Thank you, everyone. This event was produced by TechAbout Insights. This is TechAbout's data research and intelligence units, providing actionable insights for startups, governments, ecosystem players across Africa. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And don't forget to subscribe to the TC Daily, which is a weekly roundup of everything. Um, most comprehensive information of what's happening in Africa. For many people that have asked about like the video, um, you would get the video. This event is recorded and it's going to be shared to everyone. So make sure you don't miss it. Follow us on social media and also sign up to CC Daily. Thank you everyone for joining. This has been very enlightening. Thank you. Bye Thank for you. now.